friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And I'm here for my regular Monday this and that video. And if you are new, any video that you see titled with the words this and that in it means it's a multi-topic video. They're not always how-to videos or recipe videos but they're about giving you updates on various things going on, leading you back to videos that I already have. There are single topic videos on how to do or make things or certain recipes and to answer any questions that have come in through the past week. So please understand that, that the purpose of these isn't to teach you necessarily how to do all these things, but to lead you back to videos I already have on that. Though I do sometimes still share recipes in them and I do sometimes still show you how to do things in them. So let's get started on the topics of today and I am going to very roughly share a recipe today because I keep forgetting to break it down and get all the pictures and maybe eventually I'll do a separate video on it but I'm just going to do a real rough overview and that is on making a gluten-free berry crisp. So this last weekend I made one and until I got most way through most of the way through the process I remembered I was going to do a video so I did get a few still shots and really I it's like anything else I don't do it the same way every time but when it comes to making any kind of fruit crisp they're the one of the easiest things to do and keep it gluten free because you can use anything it's not like making a yeast bread where it really matters what type of flour you use to be able to get the proper texture consistency Fruit crisp are super easy. So I used somewhere between six and eight cups of fruit. I had blueberries, currants, and strawberries all from last year. And I just mixed them all together in my pan. And then I added to that a half cup of coconut sugar and then about a quarter cup of a gluten-free flour. I actually don't remember which one I used in the berry part, but it can be anything. It can be arrowroot starch. It can be potato starch. It can be organic corn starch, it can be tapioca starch, kudzu, so many different things, or any type of gluten-free flour, whether it be buckwheat, white rice, brown rice, whatever you want to use. I think I used brown rice flour in that, and that's just to help it thicken up as it bakes. Then for the topping, I did one part of the buckwheat flour to one part rolled oats, I just old-fashioned rolled oats, and that's all organic, and it's all totally gluten-free, and I used probably about a heaping cup of each one because I was trying to make a lot of the topping. Then mix those together real well, added just a little bit of salt, and then a cup of sugar to that. You need a little bit more sugar in that one. And that one I did use the organic cane sugar. But of course, you can adjust it to suit you. And then into that, I cut in the butter. And I used about three quarters of a cup of butter. I used to always go by feel. I start with a whole stick, cut it in. If I need more, I, I put in another half a stick. And that's what I did. And then just cut that in and break it up. I, sometimes I'll use my hands and roll it like this to break the parts up as small as I can and then just sprinkle that over the top and you can do this with apples it doesn't have to be berries and then I baked it 375 for about I think I, I baked it for a half an hour because I don't use the oven that much I usually do a lot of stuff on the wood stove so I always forget and I just make stuff up as I go so I think I did a half an hour and then checked it and then went for another 15 minutes the whole idea is you want to make sure it bakes good enough that the berry part will thicken but also so that the layer on top will brown some and it turned out really good so when we went out to our friend's house for dinner and they're all gluten free I was able to take that with me so it's really simple. You can use any kind of gluten-free flour to make that topping super duper easy. Okay, so let's move on to some other topics for today. And that is, well, right here, I finally got found some organic roasted and salted sunflower seeds. That's hard to do. Patrick loves snacking on sunflower seeds, especially whenever he has any long trips. Sometimes he has to go down to California to see his dad. Having some sunflower seeds with him is something that he can snack on. It's a healthy snack. It helps keep him awake and energized. So I was really glad to finally find these. And I'm going to go ahead and shoot a separate video on how I'm going to be putting these up. Even though I have a lot of videos of putting up nuts and seeds, I'm going to go ahead and do a fresh one because there's always new people coming in and they like to see how I do this stuff. So yes, I'll be vacuum sealing it into jars. And uh, anyway, this will be nice to have. And Patrick requested that I vacuum seal into pint-sized jars. 
so that they're ready to go for him because that's the size he likes to carry. Over here, I have three one gallon bags of my grapes from our garden from 2021 and I need to start pulling them out and turning them into wine. And the reason why is because these grapes, they're, they're very tart grapes, especially because of where we live. They don't have the time to fully sweeten up before it's time to start harvesting them. And so even though these are mostly Niagara Whites that are supposed to be a good juice grape, mine always end up pretty tart. And by the time they finally start to get sweet, the little birds come around and start eating them all. So I have to get them off the vine and put them up. But because they are very tart, they make a good wine grape in that way. And so I've, some of my best wine that I've made have, has been from my own homegrown grapes. So I have three one gallon bags. I never can remember how many bags I need to make a single gallon of the wine. But I got to get them out of the freezer because now my rhubarb is starting to grow like crazy. And I'm going to be doing the same thing with that. I'm going to be chopping it up and freezing it like I did last year because it also makes an excellent wine. Even if you don't drink, like, like for me, I don't drink, but I make wine quite a bit because it has many uses. So I have an older video on the many uses of homemade wine and why you might want to consider making it. Even if no one in your family ever drinks at all, it's very handy to have on hand for many things but it can also be used for barter and so the two best ones that I make are the rhubarb margarita wine well I call it a wine but it's actually not technically a wine unless it's made with grapes just a little tidbit there but which by the way anything that's called wine like in the Bible it it can be grape juice or it could be fermented it doesn't matter because wine referred to anything that came from the vine any juice that came from the vine so at any rate, a little, little side note there, but the anyway, the rhubarb, I, I press out the rhubarb juice after I freeze it. That makes it easier. Same thing with the grapes, and so I have a video specifically on that. So anyway, if you're interested in learning how to do it yourself, I have a whole series on winemaking, and in that series, I also have the one more specific to the rhubarb, margarita wine, and I also have a video on how to make homemade mead, and I always flavor my meads, and mead is made from honey, water, and then you can choose to add flavor flavorings to it. So I have all that in that playlist I'll link to in the description box down below if you want to learn. And then another thing is that I finally broke down and invested. I only brought two of them in there because there's a total of 12 in the Foxfire books because a lot of my subscribers have been telling me for years these are excellent books and even my father-in-law who's from North Carolina and he really doesn't read much but he recommended these books as well. The Foxfire books and this was the first time I found such a good deal on these books. They're all brand new. I got the full set for $215. And that sounds like a lot of money. Excellent price, though, because every I had been looking on them for on eBay for a couple of years. And sometimes they're as much as $500. And this was actually on Amazon. I cannot, I'll give you the link down below, but I cannot guarantee they're still going to be that price because they had recently dropped down that low. But I'll go ahead and share it with you down below so you can check it out for yourself if you're interested. But there are other books that you can look into if you cannot afford an expense like that, such as Carla Emery's uh, Encyclopedia of Country Living. That is an excellent book. It's very thick. And now I think it's, it's still under $25.00 with free shipping and I'll link to that below as well. I'll also be doing a separate video on these books so I, I have time to at least look through all the topics that are in these books. I certainly won't have time to read them all but I thought it would be something good to have in our library. But I can already tell because of the great amount of topics and, and how thorough these are that I think these are going to be excellent. But if you'd like to wait for my review on that at least where I have time to just see what topics are in there and pick maybe a couple of them to read through so I can share that with you. And then one of my followers sent me a couple of books that she wrote herself and these are more for beginners. So I want to have time to look through these a little closer. Just a quick glance through. It looks like they're laid out really nice and perfect for beginners who are getting into prepping or just trying to be more self-sufficient. So just keep in mind, I'll be doing a video of a little more in-depth video on these different books so you can at least get an idea of what my feel of them is but I certainly won't have time to read through word for word I don't have time to just sit and read for enjoyment anymore sadly I miss those days but I just I just don't have the time and then another thing you just, you know you guys have been seeing my board here that Patrick made for me and this was a big one I wanted to cover today 
So I mentioned it in a couple videos back. I also did a community post where I mentioned it. And I, I had noted that this orange wood right here, this is yew wood. It's Pacific yew wood to be precise. And a couple of people kind of freaked out because, oh, yew wood is toxic. I appreciate it. I get that. But it was the same thing that happened with the turpentine. And because sometimes we're told things or we hear things and then we, we might look them up and find, oh, this is really toxic. But you got to look at all your sources and understand. So here's the interesting thing about yew wood, Pacific yew wood in particular, is the Native Americans around our area have been using it for centuries for medicinal purposes. Some of them use it for lung health, for purifying the blood, for even treating cancer, which by the way, modern medicine turned to you would for a while to help treat cancer, but then you know started going with more money making, body killing methods instead. And then here is something else that's super cool, is it is also antiviral and it is an immune stimulant. Now I know some people can't have immune stimulants, but for a lot of us, we're wanting to keep our immune system strong. And so, and obviously getting some more antivirals in there to help keep us from getting sick is great. So as such, I have absolutely no fear of rolling out my different breads or working my different breads, like the yeast breads I make. I love working them on this board so much better than on my countertop and it makes it easier to clean off and I love it and so now I know even if though this is coated quite well with coconut oil I always treat it after every use with more, another layer of coconut oil especially since it's fairly new I keep doing that um, even if it wasn't and even if some of the properties of the you would got into my bread I would be totally thrilled at that because now I know I'm just getting a little bit more goodness by doing so. So make sure that you always check everything, just like with the turpentine. Most people today hear turpentine, especially in the younger generations, and think paint thinner. They think that's all it is. Yet, long before it got used industrially, it was used medicinally by many people, including pharmacists and doctors. If you go to my turpentine video that I'll link to down below, the most recent one in particular, so many great testimonials in there. I know I keep saying it, but it's amazing the things I read in there that just made me all the more encouraged about my use of turpentine, even though I've been using it for years, and clearly I'm still alive. Okay, a couple more things is I've got some fermented eggs back here. Now, if you're concerned, because I did have somebody come in and say, oh, you should never ferment eggs. I'm a fermenting specialist, whatever. You know what? I've been doing it for years, never had a problem. And every time somebody throws out the, the word botulism, one thing that most people don't understand is that, especially in the past 10, 20 years, that has been used for fear mongering when it comes to any kind of food preservation yet it's incredibly rare yes it's real yes it can happen but it is so rare and if you even go to i, I can't remember i think it's actually the fda and you look at their website and you read about botulism even though they're all about fear mongering about stuff like that if you actually read the statistics home food preservation is at the bottom of the list when it comes to botulism scare you're actually more apt to get it from other things rather than your home preserved foods however yes you can ferment eggs and i they are fermented because they get that kind of fizziness all the way through the egg which i love and if you're concerned about it once you've let them ferment for three to four days stick them in the fridge i've never had mine spoil on me whether i leave them on the counter or stick them in the fridge it's such a, a myth all the things people want to tag botulism to yes botulism is real but everything that it gets t tagged onto is is scare tactics more than anything but when it comes to any of this stuff just use your own judgment remember people were water bath canning low acid foods for many many years long before pressure canners were ever even invented anyway let's move on from that topic and one more thing I wanted to bring up, and this is more of a question for you guys who might already know. So interestingly enough, when we went to the post office this last week to see if we had any mail in there, we found a package of canning lids that was sent to us from the company with the request of doing a video and blah, 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 and affiliate. And I'd never heard of them before. Even though it says Four Jars USA right here, if you look a little closer, you have it's really tiny somewhere on here. 
it says made in China. Most places will contact me first and most of those emails go in the trash. <laughs> most of them do. There's very few I'll pay any attention to. And that was like the hose link because I really need a new hose reel and all that. And I thought, well, I'll check it out. So I did that and I love it. I still love it. It's great. And the other one was the green stock. Almost tossed that one too until I looked a little bit closer and realized it was a USA based business. And I love my green stock. I still may consider getting another one, but I'm really happy with the one I have. But anyway, I don't do that very often unless I really want to try a product. If these people had emailed me, I would have trash that email too because I'm not interested in more canning lids especially ones that were made in China when I have a really great supply of the Tatler lids that are made here in the US and I love them so anyway I'll link to the Tatler lid video below but what I would like to know has anyone tried these lids what do you think of them because they sent me a lot so these two boxes are lids and bands and these two boxes are nothing but lids. So I think there's a hundred lids in each one of these. And it's like, well, since I have them, I kind of like to try them, but I'm nervous. I'm nervous to try any kind of lid that was made in China because I've read quite a few horror stories of people who've ended up with some Chinese made lids and they don't hold their seal or they don't seal at all or the paint comes off. Now, just a quick inspection. These look like they're probably okay, but Still, I'm very nervous to even try them. So I'd like to get any feedback on these particular lids if anyone's tried them. All right, well, that's it for my this and that for this week. So don't forget to click on either show more right down here below my channel name. That's in, it's in all caps. Or that little gray arrow over here if you're on a smart device to open the description box to see all the links I'll be putting down below that teach you how to do the fermented eggs and the wine making and some of the various things that I mentioned here. All right, well, thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.